So I just want to give you observations about deontological ethics and how it relates to consequentialist ethics. And to begin with, I'm going to do something that uh, most professors don't. I like to make references whenever possible to popular culture because um, I think it makes uh, this material a bit more relatable and um, identifiable for most people. So that being said then, let me return to my PowerPoint and we can begin. So if you want an entertaining illustration of the strengths and issues of conscience duty ethics, let me recommend this classic hilarious operetta, The Pirates of Penzance. Now the subtitle of this operetta, operetta is The Slave of Duty. And although Kant is not explicitly mentioned, it is evident that the protagonist, Frederick, is influenced by duty ethics. Now, I want to make a couple points about the plot line, but being as this is in video format, I guess you would need to, if you don't want to be spoiled, watch, wait until the next graphic uh, to turn your sound back on. So, the plot line. Um, the action of the story is prompted when a young man by the name of Frederick completes his articles of apprenticeship to the eponymous pirates. He decides that now, since he's no longer duty bound to the pirates, that his duty to the law requires him to turn his own beloved friends into the law. Until that is, it turns out that due to a technical loophole in his articles of apprenticeship, he is still an apprentice and he then suddenly backs the pirates. Now, in both these cases, when he makes these decisions, he's presented with the likely consequences of his actions, but he defers stating that his actions are predetermined because he is the slave of duty. When this play was written, utilitarian ethics was the relatively hip theory of ethics for the time, and the older Kantian school of ethics was considered a bit old fashioned and less an apt subject for satire. So, therefore, done with the spoilers. Now, let me also give another example from pop culture. When I covered the distinction between deontological and consequentialist ethics in a live classroom, I often Again, chuckle for one of my students by asking them, how many of you like watching police procedurals on TV? Well, they raise their hands. And so then I call on a student who, with a raised hand and ask, can you complete this sentence? If you have two detectives who are partners and one of them does everything by the book, dot, 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 almost without fail, I've had students respond, the other one plays by his own rules and gets results. This common and indeed very cliche kind of dynamic in this genre is a dramatic play on the conflict between deontological duty ethics and consequentialist utilitarian ethics. The cop who does everything by the book would exemplify a Kantian perspective, whereas um, the loose canon who bends or breaks the rules, but is justified because he gets results, exemplifies consequentialist or utilitarian ethics. Now, I think our authors might have unwittingly fallen afoul of what's called an equivocation fallacy. An equivocation fallacy is when you use one word that has two different meanings and you try to refute um, something by focusing on the wrong meaning. I think they might have done that here because on the one hand, they address intuitionism and the word intuition in this context has two different meanings. On the one hand, it can refer to something that is self-evident. 
for example, Aristotelian ethics, is structured around what we call syllogisms, in which you have a three-part argument. And when if you fill in the first two parts of the argument correctly, the conclusion follows logically. So for example, the most classic, most ancient of these syllogisms is what's called modus ponens. If A, then B. A, therefore B. So if you have a causal connection and the cause exists, the effect exists. Uh, the standard illustration of this syllogism is all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. But the other meaning of intuition is non-rational. When someone apprehends a truth well, without having to work step by step through logical reasoning to arrive at that conclusion. Have you ever just known something without knowing you know what you know? If, without knowing all the steps that lead to your conclusion. That would be an example of intuition in the second sense of the term. Now, from my reading of intuitionist ethics, they typically use the word intuition in the former sense. Basic principles that once identified and articulated are self-evident. An example of this would be, for example, the principle of reciprocity. Um, if um, A is appropriate for someone in a given situation and someone else is in the same situation, then A is appropriate for that second person. Uh, an example would be that if it is appropriate for Joe to take the risk of an operation that has uh, a known uh, risk of complications in order to recover from a given medical condition and Jack has the same medical condition, then it's appropriate for Jack to also consider getting that operation. The authors, however, describe intuitionism, but then they refute it on the basis of the second definition of intuition, not the first, which is the way it is usually used. Um, our authors also state rather categorically on page 48 that there's no proof of moral rules. Now, intuitionists, however, will refute that, setting forth a number of basic moral principles that have been identified. An example of intuitionism, for example, which you might be familiar with, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with some inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now that famous passage, he's saying that these truths are self-evident. That's the first meaning of intuition. So you see, our founding fathers were intuitionists in the former sense of the term. Specifically, this is an example of what's called natural law, a theory of politics that holds that governments are only legitimate to such extent as they honor and protect those innate natural rights for their citizens. Now, this notion was developed in the 18th century by the philosophers Locke and Rousseau. Ironically, however, this notion was effectively anticipated by the philosopher and reformer Confucius 2,200 years earlier. Confucius held that rulers had the right to rule because of the quote unquote mandate of heaven. This is somewhat analogous to the notion of the divine right kingship in the West, a doctrine that held up long into the 1800s. However, unlike divine right kingship, an emperor could lose the mandate of heaven if he failed to be benevolent to his subject. If the emperor owed a duty to his subjects to be benevolent, the subjects owed a duty to be loyal. But if the emperor was not benevolent, then the subjects no longer owed him loyalty. Um, essentially then, Confucius articulated what's what we call the notion of a right to revolution back around the fifth century BCE. And it took our philosophers here in the West uh, up until the 1700s to reinvent this idea. Now, 
he, the authors also mentioned divine command theory. Um, our, and to their credit, they do a pretty good job of covering key arguments for and against divine command, but I think they missed a key issue. If we know what is right or wrong from something like the Ten Commandments, some sort of divine command, how should we decide if we have a conflict between two different commandments? For example, the authors have mentioned Kohlberg's hypothetical about a man confronted with the choice of letting his wife die for lack of a given medication and versus stealing the medication. This is a conflict between protecting life and the duty to protect property. Universal liability. I think this is worth talking about a little bit, even though it's a mouthful. Now, I have a standard way that when I'm teaching in class, I explain the concept of universal liability. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not practical in, here in online uh, session. So I will just give you a summary of what I do. Now, when I cover this notion in class, before the class starts, I talk to one of the first students to come into the classroom and uh, I ask him, um, if I can put my coffee cup in front of him or her um, for a uh, demonstration in the class. And if the student accepts, I recommend that maybe they should, you know, fiddle with the cup every so often to give the impression that it's theirs. I like to walk around the classroom when I teach. And when I talk about Kant, I talk I cruise around the classroom, walk by that student, and pick up that coffee cup and start sipping from it. Well, inevitably, some students get upset with this action because they assume that I have just stolen a cup of coffee from a classmate right in front of them. At which point I question someone who's upset and ask them why, are, why they are upset. And they usually respond, well, how would you feel if one of us just just started drinking from your coffee cup. At that point, I come clean and re reveal that it is indeed my coffee cup and that their classmate uh, is in, in cahoots with me. They, but also I point out that essentially they have just articulated uh, the principle of universal liability that we should not engage in any action which we wouldn't want to become a universal law applicable to all people. One last note, Kant's distinction between an end in itself versus a means to an end. Kant would have objected to utilitarianism on a number of grounds, but one key point would be how utilitarianism in principle is consistent with treating people as a means to an end if that end has the effect of maximizing happiness for everyone. A classic illustration of this concept is in a short story uh, by Ursula K. Le Guin titled, The One Who Walk Away From Amalus. Now, it's a very powerful and telling story, but, um, and I have linked linked to it in the text version of this announcement. Now, as I read it, I doubt if uh, a few more observations about conscience ethics. As I read it, I doubt if Kant would consider an egoist who holds self-interest as the cardinal consideration of the choice of actions to be ethical per se. One major objection to conscience duty ethics is the notion that all the duties articulated are understood to be equivalent and absolute. I have linked a very short video that um, presents a hypothetical drawn from Kant's own writings that illustrates its objection. This is the Kantian equivalent of, uh, of the trolley problem. Finally, I want to give kudos to our authors who on page 60 draw an example of duty ethics from a non-Western source. The passage that we allude to is from the Bhagavad Gita, and which is an example, ancient example 
of duty ethics. It might even go past back past before Confucius. Um, let me add that uh, so far, uh, as I'm reading this textbook, I've, you'd almost get the impression that ethics hadn't been thought about or considered by any culture west, uh, east of ancient Greece. So I'm glad to see that they have this one illustration from India. Finally, let me ask you a question. What do you think? Is there a way to harmonize the best aspects of consequentialism slash utilitarianism with conscient duty deontological ethics? Both of these schools have important points in their favor, but they also both have issues. Is there a way to reconcile duty ethics and consequentialist ethics? What do you think? Well, there are all my thoughts on the chapter on deontological ethics. Ciao for now.